Theater, a series of hour-length dramas based on some of the most significant writings of our time, with an introduction and commentary by one of the great personalities of the American theater, the distinguished actress, director, and producer, Eva Legallion. Miss Legallion. Good evening once again, and good afternoon to our friends in the West. Last Sunday, I announced that our play today would be based on Whistle Stop, the novel by Marietta Wolfe. Unfortunately, due to last-minute difficulties, we've had to change our program. And instead, we're bringing you a transcribed dramatization of a book by one of the most brilliant of modern English writers, Aldous Huxley. After many a summer dies the swan is the curious title. Huxley wrote it in 1939. It's a devastating and bitter satire in spots excruciatingly funny. There's also something decidedly macabre about it. Many of you may not agree with it at all, but I'm pretty sure that you'll all be interested in it. Huxley never fails to be stimulating and provocative even when one disagrees with him most violently. The setting of this strange intellectual excursion is California, and our performance today actually takes place there, for while I am speaking to you from New York, the players of our company are in Hollywood. I invite them now to begin their performance of Aldous Huxley's After Many a Summer Dies the Swan. I was reading Wordsworth when the train pulled into Los Angeles Station. Not that I'm overly fond of Wordsworth, but my instructions were to search for a tall chauffeur in a grey uniform, and I presume his were to track down a middle-aged Englishman carrying the poetical works of William Wordsworth. Mr. Pointed, sir. Welcome to Los Angeles. Oh, Mr. Stoke chauffeur? That's right, sir. I'd have known you by your voice even without that book. Yes, my voice. <laughs> wait, wait, why is it that in America I have only to ask for a cup of coffee to draw gales of laughter? <laughs> it's quite provoking. Uh, I beg your pardon, sir? Oh, never mind, never mind. If you will collect my box at the window, we'll be off. <laughs> Mr. Stoit's motor car rode exceedingly smoothly, and I abandoned myself to the pleasure of looking. The Southern California rolled past the windows. We were traveling westward. The sunshine lit up each building and sky sign as though with a spotlight. The billboards were most emphatic. Do things go places with console gas. That's one of ours, Mr. Portage. Oh, uh, uh, what's that? Uh, console gas. That's Mr. Stoich's company. He's president. Uh. Broken romance. Science proves that 73% of all adults have halitosis. Beverly Pantheon, the cemetery that is different. Funerals are not expensive. That's ours, too. Oh, you, you mean the Beverly Pantheon? Finest cemetery in the world, I guess. We could stop by if you'd like to see it. Oh, look. Over there to the right. Beverly Pantheon? No, that's where Ginger Rogers lives. Oh. Yes, sir, Ginger Rogers. Pantheon's down the road, sir. You too can have abiding youth with drill form figure control. That's uh, Groucho Mark's place over there. Ah, here we are, the Beverly Pantheon. Beverly Pantheon, the personality cemetery. Oh, that's the Tower of Pisa, isn't it? Except that it doesn't lean. It's the showplace of the Beverly Pantheon. Mr. Stoyd had it straight and special. Two hundred thousand dollars, that's what it costs. Yes, sir. Good. We went through a whirlwind tour of the Beverly Pantheon. Everything. The pet cemetery, the poet's corner, the black marble vestibule of ashes, leading to the supermodern burning mortuary furnace. And finally the pantheon itself, and overall the inescapable crooning of a perpetual Wurlitzer automatic organ. This new heaven of the Beverly Pantheon seemed to promise all the more conventional delights, with the added joys of everlasting tennis, eternal golf, and millennial swimming. Some 
glass, the Pantheon, eh, Mr. Portage? Uh, yeah, oh, yes, 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 definitely. Uh, um, out of this world, what? Now, look up there. Between those hills, there it is. That's Mr. Stoit's place. On the summit of the bluff, as though growing out of the rock, stood a castle. The thing was gothic, medieval. Medieval, not out of vulgar historical necessity like the castles of France and Germany, but out of pure fun and wantonness. Platonically, one might say. It was medieval as only a witty and irresponsible modern architect and engineer is equipped to be. Want a ride, Mr. Proctor? Oh, hello, George. Nice of you to stop for me. Always glad to, Mr. Proctor. Uh, this here's Mr. Portage from England. I'm sure he won't mind. Oh, not at all, not at all. Pleased to meet you, sir. How do you do? Uh, visiting Mr. Stoit, Mr. Portage? I am uh, here on business. Uh, I'm to catalog the Hoberg papers. Mr. Stoit's just bought them. A historical treasure, you know. Hmm. You're a scholar? <laughs> well, well, a bit, yes. A scholar and a gentleman. Well, there are worse types of human beings... I might almost uh, claim to have been one myself long ago. You're, you're not William Proctor, are you? Not the one who wrote short studies in the Counter-Reformation? Well, well I'm jiggered. <laughs> <laughs> Remarkable building, the castle, isn't it? Ah, poor Joe Stoit. Think of having that millstone round one's neck. Well, I shouldn't exactly think it is a millstone. Well, neither does Joe, but it is. Uh, perhaps it might help you if you knew about Joe. You know, we were at school together, he and I... Only nobody called him Joe in those days. We, we called him Slob or Jelly Belly. <laughs> you see, Joe was a fat boy, and how we punished him for his glandular deficiencies. You might remember that fat boy when you meet the man. Help you to understand. Well, here I am at home. Uh, George, I'll get off here. Okay, Mr. Proctor. Have a good time, Mr. Boyd. Uh, thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Portage, pleased to meet you. My name's Stoit, Joe Stoit. Oh, I, uh... Did... You're older than I thought. Oh, the, the, the sear and withered leaf, you know, one sinking... Uh, into... What's your age? Fifty-four. Only fifty-four? <laughs> Ought to be full of pep at fifty-four. How do you do with a lady? <laughs> well, mon beau prince, oh, mon été. What's that? No use talking foreign languages to me. <laughs> I'm head of an oil company, got 2,000 stations in California alone. And not one man in any of the old filling stations that isn't a college graduate. <laughs> Go and talk foreign languages to them. There, you are to do those old papers, aren't you? What the devil is the name of them? Roebuck, Hoebuck? Just bought them this summer. Uh, the Hoebuck papers. Hoebuck, that's right. Uh, yeah. What were you saying about women when you started that foreign stuff one day? <laughs> well, uh, well uh, what, what, what was implying it was uh, normal for one's age? Well, how do you know about what's normal at your age? Go talk to Dr. Obispo about that. Dr. Uh, Obispo? It won't cost you anything. He's on salary. He's a house physician. Knows everything about long life. Want to see the castle? I'll, uh, I'll take you around. Oh, that's very kind of you. Uh, I've already seen your, your burial ground. What? What's that? My burial ground? What the devil do you mean? Well, I, 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 I understood. Well, uh, that is uh, the, that you own the Beverly Pantheon. Oh, oh, that. Well, don't say that again. Not more moderate, you know. Can't get excited, Obispo Warney. Come on. It, uh, it is a large castle, isn't it? Uh, Twenty stories. We'll go down to the hospital now. Stoit Hospital for children. They call me Uncle Joe. Well, they do. <laughs> Poor kids. Makes me feel I'd kind of like to cry. By the way, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Portage. Uh, have you got a religion? Well, more or less, yes. Uh, the late Mrs. Stoit was very religious. Taught me a slogan. God is love. There is no death. Good one, eh? There is no death. <laughs> 
Well, I think it is. There used to be a text over my bed when I was a kid. Orange letters on a black cardboard. It is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Different, isn't it? Now, what the devil made me bring that? Oh, never mind. To Blazers with a hospital. We'll go up to the roof. Got a pool up there. We'll have a swim before dinner, huh? The view from the swimming pool was remarkable. One had only to turn one's head to see successive vistas of plain and mountain, green, tawny, and faint blue. If one turned the other way, one saw Miss Virginia Monsible poised on the diving board. Miss Monsible was, uh, <laughs> well, uh, the chauffeur informed me that she was a particular friend of Mr. Stoit's. And in his friends, Mr. Stoit was particular, for she was, well, uh, she was excessively beautiful with not much bathing dress to conceal it. There, Uncle Joe. You're feeling kind of good. Oh, feeling fine, baby. Oh, doesn't the sun feel good? Skinny baby, I'd like to eat you. I'm tough. Kid. Yeah, a little tough, kid. What'd you bring old Baldy here for, Uncle Joe? Oh, to catalog some old papers I bought in England. <laughs> Looks funny, doesn't it? <laughs> Floating around that pool like an yeah, old Buddha. Yeah. I'm going to dive in and duck him. Oh, don't go away, baby. I did some business this morning. Might make a lot of money, real money. How much? Maybe half a million, maybe a million, maybe even more. Uncle Joe, I think you're wonderful. Ah, it's easy, baby, easy. Easy nothing. I say you're wonderful. So just keep your own mouth shut. <laughs> Stop it. You're tickling me. Stop it. Oh, my <laughs> wonderful Uncle Joe. Uh, I'll give you presents if the deal goes through. What'd you like, baby? I don't know. I never really want things bad. Oh, Joe, I don't think I want anything. Ah, oh, that's what I like about you, baby. No, I don't want anything. Don't you, Virginia? Well, I do. No, Bispo, don't pussyfoot up like that. I don't like to be startled. I don't like it at all. Not at all. Mr. Stoyd, I don't advise you working up a temper. Anger is a poison, my friend, and not a slow one. But if you want to shorten your life instead of lengthening... All right, all right. Uh, what do you want, Doctor? To be precise, I want to inject 1.5 cubic centimeters of this stuff into the great man's gluteus majus. Uh, so off with you, Virginia. Sig, you're an old... Up along, Angel. You think you're Tyrone Power or something, don't you? You're ready for the injection, Mr. Stewart. No, Bispo, I don't like the way you talk. No, I don't suppose you do. It makes your blood boil, but when your blood boils, your blood pressure goes up, and, well, you just can afford to be angry with oh, me. Oh, Bispo, I, I... I put you on your feet after the last stroke, Mr. Stoyer. Without me, perhaps next week, the week after, within the year... I don't talk like that. I don't like it. But if I continue my research, perhaps ten years more for you. Or 20, or 30, or even... Well, there's no guessing about that. You think there's a chance, so Bispo? You really think that... That, my friend and benefactor, time will tell. Red enough the injection. Roll over. Careful with that, Tompkins. Those papers are valuable. They sure got them crated up solid. I get them now. Uh, beautiful, aren't they? Hundreds of years. Hobart after Hobart. Knights, barons, earls. Uh, records, letters, papers never catalogued. Oh, look here. Look here. Uh, 1576. Yeah, sure. Uh, look, Mr. Portage, I I'll be going. I Show here something, a copy of the Marquis de Sade. Oh, I've never even seen one on my mind. My, what an imagination. Oh, delicious. Just uh, call me when you want them other cases open. 
Uh, don't let me disturb you. I'm... I said, don't let me disturb you. I, I, what? My name is Obispo. <coughs> Dr. Sigmund Obispo, physician in ordinary to His Majesty King Stoy I. And let's hope also the last. Oh, yes. Uh, I saw you at the pool. There's quite a stack of words you've got here. <laughs> and dribble. Mm hmm? A string of words called religion, another string of words called philosophy, half a dozen other strings called ideals. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know how you liberal artists stand it. Don't you find there's some sense once in a while? Oh, it's a great deal of fun, you know. Uh, hmm, just scrabbling about in the dust heaps. <laughs> Must worry about the meaning. <laughs> <laughs> Frank, anyway. Most of the PhD boys are blasted snobs trying to pull that high moral culture on you. You know, uh, uh, wisdom rather than knowledge. Mm. You know. At least you admit you're in your racket just for fun. That's what I'm in mind for. Oh? Mind you, I'm not entirely blind to the charms of your racket. Say, is, is that book the market is sad? Well, I it rather repairs to Well, well it is. It's, just, uh, it's quite a man, you know. Mind if I borrow this? I've got a particular use for a book like this. Oh, but I see, I, I really yes, don't... Yes, thank you, you very much. Uh, come on down to the hall, see my laboratory. Well, you know, really, I should. I mean, these papers... They've waited the... 500 years. Come on, come on. Well, I, uh, I suppose... Uh, uh, longevity is my racket, you know. I wouldn't be able to follow it if I were in practice. Devil of a nuisance looking after patients. That's why I fastened on Joe's toy. Oh, he's concerned with longevity? Concerned? <laughs> the old gold scared silly. <laughs> it's a panic with him, fear of death, you know. And uh, I've been living on that panic for five years. Oh, really? It's a researcher's paradise. I have everything I need with old Joel thrown in as a guinea pig. Oh, cooperative? <laughs> oh, well, he's ready to submit to any provided that gives him some hope of staying above the ground a few years longer. Oh? You know, it's an interesting thing, old age. Why should dogs be senile at 14 and parrots alive and kicking at 100? Or a fish live to 200 without signs of senility? While poor Joe Stoyd... Oh, here we are. Hey, oh, yeah, fragrance, oh, huh? That's our mice. We've got nearly a thousand of those. Hello, Doc. Oh, my assistant, Pete Boone. Pete, this is Mr. Portage. Glad to meet you, sir. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, pleased to meet you. Pete is a bright boy. Knows his physiology. Good with his hands, too. Uh, here, look at these mice, Portage. Lively, aren't they? Lively enough while the effects last. They're shut full of what I poured into old Joe this morning. Not that the old devil needs it. Young Virginia, right? <laughs> I'll go get the diet sheets now. Well... Put my foot in it again. I beg your pardon? <laughs> Poor old Pete. He's fantastically in love. Thinks our Miss Mournsipples like something in the works of Tennyson, you know, chemically pure. <laughs> 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 well, if it makes him happy, I won't spoil. Oh, uh, speaking of Uncle Joey, take a look at this. Fish by Joe. Yes, and what fish? Joe had them stolen from an estate in Europe. They've got rings in their tails dated 1761. 1761? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's the beginning of my favorite period. Those carp are nearly 200 years old. Perfect health. And there's no reason why they shouldn't live another three centuries. It's incredible. There's something about the flora and the intestinal tract of those fish. Something that kills the poisons that produce senility. It's, it's something that... <laughs> oh, rather a fountain of you. <laughs> That's <laughs> all right, my friend. Go ahead, laugh, laugh. But we're working on the operation that will transfer that something from the carp to... Well, now we're working on mice. Mice? Yeah. After that, large animals. And if it works all right on dogs and baboons, <laughs> it ought to work on Uncle Joe. We had dinner in the small dining room. It was the sort of place you think of when you hear the word cafe, with original Fra Angelico murals on the walls for his spiritual touch. Mr. Stoit was with us and Miss Monsiple. Dr. Obispo spent the hour telling stories to the lady while young Pete gazed at her with a 
a rapt pre rationalite expression. After lunch in Virginia, Pete and the doctor went off to feed the baboons. Here now, Virginia, throw the potatoes to them. Oh, aren't they cute? Absolutely divine. Well, divine is an adjective I hadn't thought of applying to baboons. But, uh, here, throw the rest of the food. That old fellow's looking seedy, Doc. He won't even come eat. He's hungry, all right. He's just afraid to leave his lady friend. Here, Angel, throw this potato in front of you. Okay. There. He's taking notice now. <laughs> but so is the young chap on the rocks. Look at him. He's just waiting till the old boy gets away so I can dash for the lady. Come on, funny face. Go get the carrot. Here. <laughs> and there goes young Lancelot sweeping down on the lady. That's young love for you. Oh, aren't they cute? The old one's too busy eating to notice us. Aren't they cute? Aren't they human? Mr. Proper would say it the other way around. Aren't we baboon-like? Oh, that's silly. Well, I don't know. He's pretty smart. Say, uh, as long as we're half down the hill, why not go see him? Get Portage to go with you. Oh, oh Proppy scares me stiff. Besides, I think I've got a headache. Uh, Sig, couldn't you give me something for it? Men salon, copper salon. Well, does it taste bad? I don't like nasty medicine. <laughs> no. no, 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 it's Latin. Sound mind and sound body. But <laughs> the mind has just been demonstrated and the body is evident. You talk too much, Sig. Yes, yes, I know, dear. But only a trifle of it filters down into that pretty head. And if you're not going with Pete, come back to the castle. I'll read you an old book I borrowed from our English friend. Who's interested in old books? <laughs> Don't worry, darling. You will be in this one. <laughs> Mr. Portage, did you meet the ogre of the castle? I remembered about, uh, <laughs> uh, Jelly Belly. That made it easier, Mr. Proctor. Ah, poor Joe. I remember even at school, he was the kind of fat boy who bluffs it out. Fights back, buys popularity by treating the girls to ice cream when he has to steal a dime from his grandmother's purse to do it. Believes it when they say he'll go to hell. Poor Joe. Ah, but that's life. And, uh... Speaking of life, Pete, how's the work going? Oh, it's going just fine. Mm -hmm. If you succeed, what happens? Why, life is prolonged. Yes, I know that, but I, I meant something else. Uh, a dog, for example, isn't that supposed to be a wolf that uh, hasn't fully developed? A sort of uh, unborn wolf? Isn't that so? Mm -hmm. There's a theory like that. In other words, it's a tame animal because it doesn't have time to grow up to savagery. Isn't that supposed to be one of the mechanisms of evolutionary development? Yes, that's right. But what will happen with man? What would he grow into if you lengthened his life? You know, Pete, time and craving, that's our life. Now, what are you offering us? Another 200 years of time and craving? Time, Mr. Proper, for more good. Mm, time doesn't guarantee good, my boy. But you can fight for good, Mr. Proper. We fought for good when I was in Spain. And you'll find, Pete, that evil comes even out of those fights for good. <clears throat> but, uh, well, what do you expect people to do when we're attacked by fascists? Sit down and let their throats be cut? No, no, I expect them to fight. People generally do, and the results are generally disastrous. I should like them to try something more effective someday. Yeah, but that's cynicism. Defeatism. Hey there, Doctor! Oh, here comes the Lord of Stoit Castle. What is it, Joe? Why the devil can't you leave my man alone? Hmm? Which man, Joe? My estate manager. Interfering with him in his work. You've been bothering him about those blasted farm hands again. What do you think you're doing? What's the idea? The idea? It's an old one, Joe. Your manager's treating those harvest hands like vermin, not like men and women. They haven't enough to eat. You're trying to make reds out of them. You're a lousy agitator. I uh, thought we were talking about eating. You're stalling. Eating and working, wasn't that it? I've put up with you for years, Bill, for old time's sake. But you're making the place dangerous for decent people to live in. 
I'll have you run out of the valley. I'll see that you're... You're... I'll see that you're... I'll... Uh, uh, somebody get me a chair. Here, here you are, Mr. Stoyle. Uh, thanks. Thanks. Uh, I mustn't get angry. Obispo said so. A uh, terrible thing. Terrible to fall into the hands of a living God. Uh, terrible. What's the matter, Joe? Uh, nothing. I'm better. It's all right. I've got something to show you, Joe. Been meaning to. It's, uh, it's a sun motor. A thing for making use of solar energy. Runs my electric generator. What? Why the devil do you want to do that? Haven't you got your current wired in from the city? Oh, of course, but I'm trying to see how independent I can be from the city. A uh, little Jeffersonian democracy. Oh, uh, you're turning back the clock, Bill. You're going against progress. Am I? Well, don't worry about it, Joe. No, uh, you're a crackpot, Bill. I guess you always will be. But remember what I said. You stay away from my manager. I, I won't stand it. I'm the boss on my estate. Mr. Stoyt forgot all about his blood pressure and the living God, and he felt suddenly happy. It occurred to him that in spite of everything, Bill Proctor liked him. In a glow of good feeling, he went home to his castle and straight to Virginia's boudoir. Oh, Uncle Joe. Uncle Joe. Hello, baby. Glad to see me. My baby. Oh, Uncle Joe. Good afternoon, Mr. Stoyce. Oh, Miss What are you doing here? I was a bit worried by the call for yours at lunch. That's why I came up here to make sure of catching you the moment you came in. The prevention, you know, is better than cure. I'm not going to let you get influenza if I can help it. No, is that it? Well, I feel fine. Nothing wrong with me at all. That cough wasn't anything. Only my old, you know, uh, chronic bronchitis. Yes, yes, but I'd like to listen and open your shirt. Huh? He's right, Uncle Joe. You wouldn't want anything to happen. Well, all right. That's fine. Now, breathe in deeply. Breathe. <sighs> Night fell on Stoit Castle, and the long halls were shrouded with shadows. In his room, Pete Boone was dreaming of Virginia, trying to equate his vague yearning for political and religious justice with the warm glow he felt when he considered Miss Monsible, uh, even objectively. While in the young lady's room, the object of his adoration was busy redecorating her toenails. Oh, darn. Polish is coming off my toe. Darn it. Darn it. Oh, Polish thinks. Uncle Joe? Uncle Joe? Good evening, Anne. Sig, what are you doing here? I thought we might have a little talk. After all, we were interrupted this afternoon. Sig, you're crazy. Uncle Joe will kill you if he finds you. Why, he'll pull that gun right out no, of his no, no, pocket. No, 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 darling, he won't, he won't. You can take the word of a medical man, is it? Uncle Joe will sleep through the last trump. I've just seen to that. <laughs> I think you're awful. Well, don't let me interrupt your labors. Proceed with your paint job. Yeah. Woman's work is never done. You see... I don't like the way you talk. The polish, darling, is running. Oh, darn. I don't like your getting fresh with me. You know, Uncle Joe almost caught you this afternoon. With my trusty hypodermic, my dear, I disarm all suspicion. But you're not even romantic or anything. You just laugh at me and you make dirty cracks. Well, it isn't even nice. <laughs> You know, I admired the way you flirted with young Pete this evening. Uncle Joe was hopping jealous of her. Oh, darling, poor Pete. <laughs> Just wait till I get time for you. No, <laughs> my toe Oh, you. 
Well, it takes a professor of pharmacology to put an old buzzard into a coma with a few drops of this and that. I won't have you calling Uncle Joe a buzzard. No. Shall we say then a senile, foul-smelling goat? Why, you dirty. Uncle Joe's a better man than you'll ever be. I think he's wonderful. Yes, yes. You think he's wonderful. But all the same, in about five minutes, you'll be kissing me. What? Why, you filthy, dirty man. Look out, darling. You're spoiling the polish on your toes. Just wait till I'm finished. I don't believe I would. You know, the perfume of yours is strong enough to cut right through the stink of the polish. Darn you. Get away from me. No good. Virginia, I believe you're going to kiss me now. Oh, you rotten ape. bedroom, under a 25-foot mural of the crucifixion of St. Peter by El Greco, the Lord of Stoit Castle slept with a revolver under his pillow and with fear sitting at his bedside. Crawling, damp fear. In his dream, the shroud flapped and he heard the squeak of the screws he clamped down the heavy lid of his coffin. Listening to After Many a Summer Dies the Swan by Aldous Huxley. And here again, Miss Eva Legallion. As a playwright, he has been less successful, though I've always liked his play, The World of Light. Some critics have resented his increasing concern with the field of mysticism, which has naturally caused a change in the manner as well as the contents of his work. Sidney Case says of him, for instance, from being anxiously intellectual, he became too confusedly anti-intellectual. Well, people who think along these lines bemoan the fact that he has become less and less an entertaining novelist and more and more a man absorbed in the search for truth. I see no reason to condemn a man for that. Might be a good thing for the state of the world in general if more of us engaged in this arduous occupation. One of the results of this concern of his is his book, The Perennial Philosophy, which has opened doors to many thousands of people, including myself, and which seems to me a tremendously valuable contribution to living. But we'd better get on with our story, which presents Mr. Huxley in what one might perhaps call his middle period. So we'll resume with Act Two of After Many a Summer Dies the Swan in just a moment. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. KFI, Los Angeles, Earl C. Anthony, Incorporated. 102. 102. 102. 102. 102. Brew 102. Brew 102 is the right light brew. 102. Perfected after brewing. 101 brew. 102. Brew 102 is the brew for you. A whale of a pale dry brew. Meyer Brewing Company, Los Angeles. Now, Act Two of the new theater's transcribed production of After Many a Summer Dies the Swan. Muddling about with the Hoburg papers was completely fascinating. The fifth Earl of Garnister, about 1789, writes as follows. If men and women did woo as noisily as do cats, what Londoner could ever hope to sleep o' nights? 
Voltaire speaks the 18th century. But the 20th century, life in Stoyt Castle came rapidly to a rolling boy. The baby, uh, uh, Miss Mortsable, had that inward dreamy look of young ladies who discovered that love does not necessarily go with the largest checkbook. While Uncle Joe became chronically ill-tempered due to jealousy of, uh, <laughs> oddly enough, young Pete. On the longevity front, Dr. Obispo swore constantly that soon we should all be living as long as crocodiles. But for those of us doomed to shuffle off the mortal coil, there is always the Beverly Pantheon, Joe Stoit President. Now the total profit, Mr. Stoit, comes to over 500000 for the three-month period. Not bad for a boneyard, eh, Mr. Stoit? Don't talk that way and close that door. That caterwauling organ ruins my digestion. Sure, Mr. Stoit, sure. Now, what'd you get me over here for? I don't like this place. I don't like cemeteries. Mr. Stoit, look, this here idea I had. You know that ridge up there by the tiny Taj Mahal? Yeah. Well, I figure we can dig right under it and make it a catacombs. A what? A class A catacombs, like in Rome. Now, how about a chapel of the martyrs with a nice plastic group of girls being eaten up by lions? People would get a big kick out of that. Sex appeal in death. What a promotion. Listen, Charlie. I don't like the idea. And there's another thing. Some young fool out there had the nerve to show me a place he said he had saved for me. Fire him. Sure, Mr. Stoyt, sure. Uh, you can get the estimates and plans for your cave, but no martyr. Not even one day, Mr. Stoyt, just one. No martyr. That's final. Uh, call my car. I want to get out of here. <laughs> You tell me about Pete Boone. He's a confused young man, if that's what you mean, Joe. I want to know what should I do about him. Why? Ginny keeps patting him like a big dog. If the kid would only make a pass at her, I could throw him out. But you can't just fire a, a, a big dog. <laughs> you still like your Virginia, eh? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I guess so. She makes you feel good. Like when you get tanked up on scotch or when you give a toy to a kid. She's kind of, uh, well, kind of like a daughter. Mm. But more than a daughter, eh, Joe? Better than a daughter. A combination, is that it? <laughs> sort of. Uh, but she's changed. She isn't, well, she isn't the same. Besides, I haven't been feeling good. That blasted cemetery always gets me down. Eh, nobody left, eh, Joe? No friends, no religion, no philosophy... And only Virginia. Well, uh, there's no sense to anything. That's what's wrong. Mm, it's an idiot world, Joe. We all live in an idiot universe. Of course, we we can't all afford to build it out of concrete and steel the way you did. You mean the castle? What's wrong with the castle? Well, nothing, if you can stand idiocy. I... Uh, never mind. I tell... Oh, never mind the whole thing. Never get a straight answer out of you lousy professors anyway. Forget it. Never should have talked to you in the first place. No. No, Joe, you shouldn't. And you lay off those harvest workers. You've been stirring them up. This is my place, Bill. My place. Working on the Hoburg papers kept me busy during the day. Most of it was dull, merely accounts, legal documents, and business letters. Not at all my cup of tea. But at 12 o'clock, I found the parchment-bound notebook belonging to the 5th Earl of Gunster. The first entry was July 1780. And as I read, I could hear in my mind's ear the strong voice of the 5th Earl, author of this remarkable journal. July 1780. One of the church livings and my gifts being vacant, my sister sent to me today a young divine whom she commends for his virtue. But I will not have him. Give me the parson that drinks deep, rides to hounds and games the night away. Such a parson tests the faith of his flock. And it is thus we come to salvation. <laughs> a wicked old fellow, now let's see. Oh. March, 1784. Open the old tombs beneath the house today. A kind of ropey slime depends from the roof 
and coats the walls. It is the condensation of decay. No, tombs beneath Gollister House. That'll cause quite a ripple in England. Let's see now. 1789, 94, 95. I have tried King David's remedy against old age and found it wanting. Warmth cannot be imparted, but only evoked. I'm an old man now, weak and shrunken, without desires. So the fifth earl suffers from Uncle Joe's complaint. Well, well, well. <laughs> July 1796. There are carp in the fish ponds at Gunnister with leaden discs which were attached to their tails in the days of Charles I, 300 years ago. Hi, George, so he's onto the carp, too. I marvel at the strength and unimpaired agility of these great fishes. The secret of eternal life is not to be found in old books or even in heaven. It is to be found in the mud and only awaits a skillful angler. The secret of life in the mud. <laughs> Well, won't that hand of his poet Joe, his best ideas on longevity, anticipated in the 18th century, and by the fifth Earl of Gardistan. You mean to say some old fossilized Earl was onto the carp theory? <laughs> Can you tell that? Well, you're not annoyed. Oh, why the devil should I be? Well, your theory, I, I mean, it's been anticipated. Uh, let's hear more about your fifth earl. You say he lived till 90? More than 90. 96 or 7. He died in the middle of a scandal once more. Oh, not really. Well, what, what sort of a scandal? Well, uh, <laughs> uh, um, it seems he had a tendency towards uh, homicidal pleasures. <laughs> killed somebody? Not actually killed, uh, just damaged. Hmm. You know, the old buzzard's line, the secret of life is to be found in the mud. That's almost a definition of science. Mm -hmm. Well, I was up to 1796. The old chap was feeling pretty seedy. A pharmaceutical tragedy. Well, I'll bet he could have been fixed up with a week of injections. Hey, get to the diary. And let's hear the old ghost speak for himself. Yeah, well, certainly. January 1797. Why should a man die at three score years and ten when a fish can retain its youth for two and three centuries? Man cooks his food before eating it and generally throws away precisely those organs of the fish in which it is most reasonable to assume that the substance preventive of decay is contained. Good Lord. Don't tell me the old buzzard is going to eat raw fish guts. That's exactly what he is doing. Now, listen. My first three attempts provoked an uncontrollable wretching. At the fourth, I was finally able to retain a few spoonfuls of the nauseating mincemeat. Oh, talk about courage. I'd rather go through an air raid than that. February, 1797. It is now a month since I began to test the truth of my hypothesis. And I am now ingesting each day not less than six ounces of raw minced viscera of freshly opened carp. Oh, good Lord. A fish has more parasites than any other animal. It makes my blood run cold. You needn't worry. The diary goes on, you know. March. Improved in strength. April, horseback riding again. I said, oh, this is more than a joke. Raw fish guts, prevention of senile poisoning, and rejuvenation. Rejuvenation. In September, he's been out fox hunting. After which, there's no entry until 1799. No entry until 1799. That's when his case is getting really interesting. He goes and leaves us in the dark. Oh, not entirely in the dark. There's an entry a little further on. The age of 81, the fifth Earl is the proud father of a bouncing baby boy. <laughs> At... Eighty-one? <laughs> well, what do you think of that? And here in 1820, he seems to be in the prime of life. 1826, he's taken on a new uh, housekeeper named Kate. At 1831, he has repairs made on the dungeons of Garnister House. And how about his health? Oh, he seems to take it for granted. 
Wait, wait. Now listen to this. March 1834. I, the criminal negligence of Kate, Priscilla, my young serving girl, has been allowed to escape from a subterranean place of confinement. Unfortunately, she bears upon her person the evidence that for some weeks she has been a subject of my investigations. She holds in her hands my reputation and perhaps even my liberty and life. Well, there it is. That's the scandal. From the old devil. <laughs> the girl must have told a story. <laughs> well, well, what's next? I, I really can't make it out. It, it is devilish odd. My funeral will be conducted with all the pomp befitting my rank and virtues. My only regret is that I shall be unable to leave my subterranean retreat to see the pageantry of woe. I go now to my own private hell, deep beneath the walls of Gonister House. And that's all. There's nothing else. Just two more blank pages and the end of the book. And nobody knows how long the old buzzard lived out. Not outside the family. There's an old woman living in Gonister House now, Lady Jane Holbrook, the last of the line, but she's completely... Polish, do you realize what this means? Well, the, the fifth Earl could still be... Yes, he could be. Bless me. I suppose he really could. Boy, but you've got to find out. I'm taking the next boat to England. <laughs> Sing, you're crazy. You're absolutely crazy. Why are we going to England? Uh, it's a secret, Angel. I haven't even told Uncle Joe yet, but you take it from me. We'll go. Well, I wish you'd go somewhere. And I don't mean England. Ah, uh, harsh words, Angel. I mean it. I don't like the way you act. I feel like I'm double-crossing Uncle Joe all the time. Darling, you are. Besides, I haven't been able to say my prayers. I don't like you, Sid. I don't like you at all. <laughs> Still, there isn't much you can do about it, is there? You make up your mind that you hate me, don't you? That you won't speak to me again, won't even look at me. Sid, go away. But you can't keep that promise, can you? You don't mean that at all. Hi there. Portage. Uh, yes, Mr. Stoyt. Uh, come on up to the roof with me. I want to talk to you. Uh, yes, of course. Get in the elevator. Oh, thank you. Rotten time today. Oh, I'm sorry. That was that blasted cemetery. Always gets me down. Going up to see Virginia now. She always makes me feel better. Wouldn't know what to do without. She's mine. She loves her old Uncle Joe. You can bet your bottom dollar on that. Here we are. <clears throat> oh, after you, Mr. Stoyton. Cut it out, Big. If you kiss me again, I'll hate you. Sure, darling. Sure, go ahead. Hate me. Uh, baby, what this Uncle Joe! You snake. Uh, you dirty, slimy, filthy snake. I'll kill you. No. I'll, I'll kill you. No, Uncle Joe, no. Look out for that gun. I'll no. kill you. I'll kill you. Get away. I, I... You're a lousy shot, Uncle Joe. Uh, let go of my arm, Jenny. No. I'll get him this time. No, no don't shoot, Uncle Joe. Let go of him, Jenny. Let go. Let him shoot if he dares. Evie. What do you mean, if I dare? I'll kill you, beast. Oh. No, no, you won't, Uncle Joe. You won't. Because then you'll die, too. What? What's that? If you kill me, it won't be long before they've got you stretched out under the black marble mausoleum at your Beverly Pantheon. Well, 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 what the devil do you mean? That I've just found a new way to keep you alive. But without me, you'll be a dead man in a month. No! No, you don't mean that! That isn't so! That isn't true, is it, Obispo? You had a stroke, Joe. You had a stroke. But I've got good news for you. There's a chance that we have found the secret of life in the mud. You found it? What is it, Obispo? What is it? I've got to have it now. Drop the gun, Uncle Joe. What? 
Uh, oh, the girl, uh, sure, sure. What is it to be so? I'm going to live. I'm not going to die. We shall see, Joe. You've got to keep me alive, Obispo. You've got to. Oh, after you tried to kill me? Oh, that was natural, didn't I? I didn't mean to. You can't let me die when you know how to stop it. You can't. If you don't mind all, I'm going to sit down. You've got to keep me living. You've got to. You can have anything you want. I can pay for anything. Anything? <laughs> well, Uncle Joe, now you are talking turkey. <laughs> yes, sir. Now you are talking turkey. The Stoit private airplane whisked the party to New York, then Gander, Newfoundland, Shannon Island, and finally, the modern chariot of the sun sat down rather roughly at Croydon Airport, London. Consul gas supplied a tremendous black limousine, and off it drove through the diluted London sunshine down into the country towards Garnister House. Mr. Stoit sprawled under a fur rug in the back seat of the car. He was on sedation by the doctor's order, so he slept fitfully as the car roared on. Dr. Obispo was at the wheel, while Virginia sat aloof on the front seat. I dreamt I dwelt in marble oh, for halls. Shut up, will you Ma- uh, No fear, awake, Uncle Joe, honey. It's out like a light. And will you love me in December as you do I could in kill May? You. <laughs> Why not? It's open season on doctors, darling. But don't worry, don't worry, Angel. We understand each other, Uncle Joe and I. We even understand about you. <laughs> I dreamed I killed the golden goose that laid the gold in it. Stop it! Uh, what? Uh, what's, I... what's the matter? <laughs> she what's ob- wrong? She objects to my singing. Goodness knows why. I have such a charming voice, particularly well adapted to a small auditorium like this car. <laughs> uh, what is it? Are we here? Yes, indeed we are here, Uncle Joe. Gunnister House. I like it, Uncle Joe. It's scary. Oh, it's all right, baby. It's all right. Yeah, look out for the creepers on the path. Not much of a garden, eh? It's all grown over. <gasps> hmm? What's the matter? Someone behind that bush. Oh. <laughs> Come on out, youngster. Come out. Look what I've got. <laughs> I've got a gas mask. That's what I've got. Oh, that's nice. Gas mask all filled with flowers, huh? What's your name? Millie. I'm Nine? Nine. Granny says I'm undernourished. Oh. Uh, does your granny live here, Minnie? In the kitchen. She's dead. Oh. Do you like candies? Huh? Uh, what the devil they call candies in England? Uh, uh, would you like some sweets? Uh, let us in and you can have them more. Well, I... I don't know. Oh, nice chocolatey sweets. Whole box of them. Well, all right. Come on. Wait, sir. Right along this hall. I don't get this, Obispo. I don't understand why we're here. Why can't you tell me? Now, don't get worried, I thought you. Obispo, can you prove absolutely there's no such place as hell? Can you prove the wrong side of the moon is not inhabited by green elephants? Oh, seriously, oh, Don't no. bother me with the nonsense. But do you think hell is possible? Everything is possible. Uh, Millie. Yes, sir? Where's the cellar door, dear? No. What do you mean, no? Just show us the door to the cellar. I won't, I'm afraid. There's ghosts down there. You don't have to go, dear. Just show us. If you don't, you shan't have any more candies. Uh, sweets. Come on, give them back. No. Yes, I'm going to eat them all up myself. Please don't. Mmm, oh, they're good. good. I want some. Oh, poor little <laughs> Millie isn't going to have any more sweet chocolates. Mmm, they're so good. I want my sweets. Now, till you show us the door to the cellar, dear. Pull that flashlight up, Angel. 
I'm scared. Yes, it's crazy. I don't like this, Obispo. It's damp down here. I'm not well. All right, you stick with us, Uncle Joe. Maybe we can fix it so you won't have to find out about hell. Wait a minute. There's a door. Is it... Is it locked? No. No, wait a minute. Come on. Oh, that's awful. That smell. <laughs> Pretty bad. Come on, come on. Uh, I don't like this. I don't like this at all. What do you think you're going to find out here? Hey, stop being a sniveling baby, Uncle Joe. I'm not sure of anything. For all I know, you may die in five minutes. No, no. Don't say that. Well, then, come on. Oh, that smell. It's getting worse. It's awful. Just around this corner here. The flashlight up. Here, give it to me. I'll, I'll go ahead. There's an iron barred door here. Wait till I get the light focused. Doesn't quite seem to... <laughs> What's the devil? What's the matter? What's going on with these folks? What are you laughing about? What? Oh, Lord. Yes, that, Uncle Joe. That, that's a feet lace. <laughs> what? For Lord's sake. What? My hairy old man Plato was right. It's an unborn ape that's had time to grow up. Look at him. Look at him, Uncle Joe. Look. Look here. Look at him. Look at him. Look at him. Isn't that too good? Look at the face. His matted hair, deep eye sockets. No eyebrows. Look at the forehead. Dirty wrinkles. And that shelf of bone jutting out over his eyes. Just look at him. Look at him scratch. Look at him, Joe. The feet lay. <laughs> What is it? What is it? It's a man, that's what it is. Look at the ribbon across his chest. That's the order of St. George. You're looking at the noble lord, the fifth earl of Gunnisburg. <laughs> no. No. Yes, yes, the fifth earl of Gunnisburg. 201 years old last January. But what, what happened to him? Just time. Time. Time? Yes, he never died. So it's time. Time for a man, the unborn ape, to grow up to be... <laughs> but it's the best joke I ever heard. It's absolutely the best. <laughs> we don't have to experiment anymore. You know what? What do you mean? You can start taking the stuff at once. Oh, no. no. Yes. Yes, if you're willing to become like that, you can live forever, Joe. What do you say? What do you say? I... Uh, oh, this part. How long do you figure it would take before a person got like that? I mean, it wouldn't happen all at once. There'd be a time while a person, well, you know, while he wouldn't change it. Oh, no, 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 no. You don't want to, Uncle Joe. You don't want to. Once you get over the first shock, I mean, it's better than dying, isn't it? Looks like he has a pretty good time. Uh, I mean, in his own way, of course. Don't you think so, Obispo? Don't you think so, Obispo? <laughs> You have heard After Many a Summer Dies the Swan by Aldous Huxley. The dramatization was by Ernest Canoy. And here again, Miss Eva Legallion. Oh, there's something decidedly ghastly about that ending. Might almost have been written by Edgar Allan Poe. Makes me glad it's still daylight here. <laughs> now about next week, we're going to present a very different kind of story in a decidedly popular vein. One for which we have had many requests. It's a new dramatization of Daphne du Maurier's great yarn, Rebecca. This is Christopher Isherwood. The story you're about to hear was written by Aldous Huxley and myself. It's based on a true incident, and it has never before been told. It concerns a man who had a gift greater than he could understand, a gift so unique that when it was shared by others, it destroyed them. <laughs> Sir.
CBS Radio, a division of the Columbia Broadcasting System, and its 217 affiliated stations present the CBS Radio Workshop, dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. Tonight, Jacob's Hands, an original news story by Aldous Huxley and Christopher Isherwood. We are proud to have Mr. Isherwood as our narrator. Original music composed and conducted by Jerry Goldsmith. On a small ranch in the Mojave Desert, not far from the foothills of the San Gabriel Mountains, is the home of Professor Arnold Carter, his sister and his daughter, retired now to this medically approved climate, nourished by the warmth of the sun. The professor lives quietly with his family and his bitterness. Shut the door! Look, Father. Where have you been? Aren't they lovely? Almond blossoms, the first of the year. Get them out of here. You want to bring on another attack of my asthma? <laughs> I'm sorry, Father. <coughs> Do you mind if I practice my singing? I can stand it if you can. Where were you at lunchtime, Sharon? Outside, looking for flowers. With Jacob, I'll wager. Good afternoon, Aunt Annie. Were you with Jacob, Sharon? What's wrong with that? Jacob wouldn't hurt a flea. Jacob is a hired hand. And you're the daughter of a fine scholar. Don't you ever forget it. That's silly. He's just a friend. But your aunt means, Sharon, is... You're a grown lady now. You've got to learn to be cautious. Things can happen. To a cripple? To a girl who walks around on crutches? Annie, see if there's some lunch left over for Sharon. Self-pity. Look at her. Dirt on her shoes. Wash up, young lady, if you expect to eat in this house. Well, who is it? All right, I'm coming, I'm coming. It's me, Professor Tom Pierce. Oh, I'll come out. You here to look at my calf, Tom? Whatever looking I can do. The way you talk, Professor, it's a waste of time. Well, come along. We'll see. All right. What kind of shape is she in? Her hind legs are paralyzed. She's got a high fever. Yeah, could be the black quarter. She's over here, Tom. Tried to keep her away from the other animals. We never can be sure. Jacob, what are you doing with that calf? Just looking after her, Professor. Didn't I tell you to leave her alone? The disease might be contagious. Here, let me have a look, Jacob. She's been collapsed like this long since yesterday. Well, I guess that's it, Professor. Black quarter, all right. All right. Jacob, get the rifle. Jacob! Sharon, stay back at the house. You can't shoot a thing just because it's lame. Did you hear me? I said go back to the house. You better go back, Sharon. It isn't pleasant. Before you do it, Professor, can I... Can I keep her for a minute? What? Can I hold the calf? Are you crazy? Get my gun. Let's not hear any more of this claptrap. You're not going to die. I won't let you die. Why? Why are you touching her, Jacob? I won't let you die. I won't. Take your hands off my calf. Do you hear her? You won't die. You won't die. Jacob, the calf's on her feet. What did you do to that calf? I demand to know. I, I don't know. Well, you must have done something, Jacob. She's on her feet now. Her hind legs move. It's not anything I did. It just came to me, a, a feeling, something I could feel moving into my hands. That's ridiculous. That calf wasn't sick to begin with. Oh, I examined him. I say he was sick. Jacob here, he's, he's a healer. He's no such thing. You think as a scientist I could Just accept... the same, I'm going to try him out. Listen here, Jacob, I got me a lame dog down at my place. You try it on him? I guess so, if you want. Yeah, and there's others around here might like to see this thing work. Nonsense. You're making too much of it. Jacob, give that calf some water. And you, Sharon, come in the house. 
and Jacob healed the dog and a cat from another nearby ranch. And the following week, a colt said to be suffering from an incurable disease. And the editor of the local newspaper... Jacob, open the door. There's a man here to see you. Ed Burton, from the paper. I'd like to speak to you, Mr. Erickson. All right. There's a lot of talk around. Some of our folks seem to think that you have the power to heal. Is that right? Well, Jacob, answer Mr. Burton. I... I guess so. Sometimes it happens. I touch an animal, a dog or a calf, and he seems to get well. I see. And do you charge money for this uh, healing? No, sir, I couldn't do that. Why not? Because, well, it, it isn't mine. Whatever this thing is, it, it just comes over me. A strange feeling, I don't know. First I feel it in my hands, then it passes on to the animal. It's quite a story, Mr. Erickson. I'd like to write it up. I think everybody should know about this power. All right with you? Sure, if that's what you want to do, I don't mind. Thanks, Mr. Erickson. Good day. I'm going to write some friends of mine in L.A. to drive up. Prominent doctors, both of them. I think they could settle this whole business once and for all. A good idea. I'd like to do a follow-up piece when they get here. Ed, do you really believe in this nonsense? <laughs> now, Professor, do I believe in Santa Claus? Jacob, this is Dr. Marlowe and Dr. Carruthers. How do you do, How Mr. How do you Erickson? do? Pleased to meet you. Now, Jacob, these gentlemen merely want to talk to you. As doctors, they're naturally curious about your uh, power to heal. We certainly are, Mr. Erickson. Dr. Carruthers is an outstanding psychiatrist. My field is neuropathology. Professor Carter and I were at Chicago University together. Before the loss of my health... I was professor of biology at Chicago. You didn't know that, did you, Jacob? No, sir. Mr. Erickson, I'm frankly skeptical about so-called miracle cures. Have to be in my profession. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you understand that. Well, I just don't know. All this talk and everything, if you don't mind, I'd just now, as soon not... Jacob, no one is going to hurt you. Of course not. Well, all right, doctor, you may proceed. Uh, Mr. Erickson, here we have a rabbit. Oh, not just any rabbit. This poor little fellow happens to be quite ill. Cancer of the lung. But, sir, uh, I... Please, let me finish. In most cases of so-called faith healing, we find the illness to be hysterical in nature. That is to say, though there is an actual and very real physical illness, its basic origin is in the mind of the sufferer. Release the tension, and you often release the illness. Hence a so-called miracle cure. Now, Mr. Erickson, we obtained this rabbit from a laboratory. We know the animal's disease. It is entirely organic in nature. We ask you to cure it. But I don't cure things. It's this feeling that comes into my hands. Yes, we understand all that, Jacob, but whatever it is, you seem to impress some people of our neighborhood. Why not let these two gentlemen in on it? They're men of science, Jacob. Yes, sir. Only I don't know if anything will happen. Sometimes it doesn't. There was a hen last week up at Tillman's, and I... We understand, I... Mr. Erickson. You just do it any way you like. We have plenty of time. Here you are, Mr. Erickson. Go ahead, Jacob. Talk to it. You're going to get well. You're going to get well. I, I won't let you die. I won't let you. Well, Jacob? You're going to get well. You're going to get well. I won't let you die. I won't let you die. I won't. Gentlemen. May I examine the rabbit, Mr. Erickson? Yes, sir. 
It's very interesting how you stroke the back of the animal. You have a great gentleness in your hands. Everyone around here says Jacob is a very talented young man. They believe in him. Well, if there is any difference, I can't detect it. Of course, we'll have to dissect the animal when we get back to L.A., to be sure, but it appears... Well, you're, you're not going to cut him open. Naturally. We want to be absolutely sure before we pass judgment. But to kill the rabbit just to Mr. find Erickson, out... Mr. If... the rabbit will die anyway. Well, Arnold, we appreciate your letting us in on this. Yes, it was a wonderful opportunity. You don't often get to test these things firsthand. Well, we'd better be getting back. Long drive, you know. I certainly do appreciate your coming out. It's been a real pleasure for me. <laughs> and I feel a lot better. Yes, I'm sure you do. <laughs> you boys go on out to the car. I'll join you in just a moment. Jacob? Yes, sir? I think you'd better pack your things. You're fired. It's me, Jacob. Sharon. Can I talk to you? Oh, I guess so, only it's kind of messy in here. Oh, I don't mind. Your father wouldn't like it if he knew that... Shh. What he doesn't know won't hurt him. I... I heard what happened today. I'm sorry, Jacob. They don't understand. They wouldn't listen. I understand. You do? It wasn't your fault. It just didn't happen, that's all. Where will you go now, Jacob? I don't know. You know where I'd go if I could? Where? To Los Angeles. Oh, not me, I was in cities before. I didn't like it. Where? What cities? Well, when I was in the Army, they shipped me overseas from New York. It was noisy and crowded. So was Paris. Paris? Oh, they have the opera there, Jacob. Imagine if I could sing in Paris at the opera. A great stage and people in fancy clothes. And a girl on crutches singing opera. Well, what's wrong with that? Everybody in the audience would laugh. I wouldn't. I wouldn't think of your leg at all. I'd be listening to your voice and looking at your face. And... Jacob. Yes? What if you could cure my leg? Sharon. I mean... It isn't as though it was deformed or anything. It isn't. It's, it's just lame, like the dog you cured. Oh, please, will you try for me? But I couldn't. Why? Well, don't you see? People and animals, they're not the same. I, I loved animals all my life. I understand that. Do I mean less to you than a dog? But that was different. Why, because animals can't talk back to you? Do you like me, Jacob? Yes. I mean a real whole lot? Yes. Then cure me. I, I don't know how. Kneel down. Take my foot. Take it in your hands. But Sharon, I... Now I, do it. Do what you did to the calf and to, to the dog and to the colt. Jacob, don't you see you have the power to make me well? I'm begging you. I want to walk. Do it for me, Jacob, please. Don't let her limp anymore. She's going to get well. She's going to get strong and well. I'm going to get well. I know it. I'm going to get well. She's going to get well. She won't be lame anymore. She'll walk like everyone else. She'll walk again. She's getting well now. The lameness is leaving her, and she's getting well. Take <laughs> Oh, it's the happiest, happiest night of my life. Look at the night. At the beautiful, beautiful night. A million stars all shining for me. I own this night. I own the world. Jacob, it's mine now. I can heal. I can heal people. I'm going to walk and run and dance the rest of my life. Jacob. What? 
When you leave here tomorrow, I'm going with you. Oh, but you can't run I'm away. I'm going with you. Sharon, no, you can't. But I am, I am. You're going to take me to Los Angeles, Jacob. And I'm going to sing and dance the rest of my life. <laughs> Sharon and Jacob left together for Los Angeles. But once there, they went their separate ways. For Sharon had only one goal, the opera. The weeks passed, and audition followed audition, and the response was always the same. Well, it's a pleasant enough voice, but a bit light for our needs. Why don't you try the popular field? And at the broadcasting and recording companies, audition followed audition. And the response was always the same. Yeah, okay, okay, Miss Carter, thank you very much. Yeah, we'll call you if something turns up. For Jacob, too, there was only one goal now, to heal the sick. But he chose another direction, a small mission near downtown Los Angeles in an area called Skid Row. And a year passed. I want you to get well. I want you to get well. I won't let you stay sick. You feel my hands on your foot. Now you're well again. You're feeling better. You see? Now you can walk. Well, what do you think of that, huh? Hello? Doc, that boy's got an act. He's for us, ain't he, Lou? Would that pull him into the art theater? Would that pull him in? I tell you, we should hire that guy. You put him on top of the bill. After Flossie does a strip number, we got it made. Uh-uh. Lou, you're crazy or something? We packed a house. Uh-uh. This boy's too big for a barbecue house. Now, I got other plans for him. Such as? Doc, we're gonna go into the healing business in a big way. You and me and this here boy, Jacob. Now, listen. You go up there after this bit is over with, and you bring that guy back to the theater with you, see? I don't care if you have to rope in time, but you bring him. Lou, listen, I need money. Honest, I'm broke, I tell Baby, you. Baby, you're always broke. Will you stop trying to make like a diver or whatever? I got dames who can sing better and live on the salary, Lou, you know? please, I gotta have the money. Okay, Miss Dolores. Lay off to Miss Dolores, will you? What's the matter? You don't like class. Okay, Lou, here he is. Wow, wow, Mr. Jacob. Are we ever glad to see you? Step right in. Jacob! Jacob! <gasps> Jacob. Sharon, what are you doing here? Do you know this broad? Old hallway. Oh, Jacob, it's really you. I, I didn't recognize you. The, Costume. Wow, oh, this here's Miss Dolores, the star of our show. Well, then you're singing. Well, that's wonderful, Sherry. Well, give us a knockdown, baby. Oh, Jacob, this is Lou Zaccone, the owner of the theater, and this is his assistant, Doc Waldo. Oh, I'm pleased to know you, Mr. Zaccone, doctor. Yeah, I'm pleased sure. To know you. This is the man who. This is my oldest friend. Wow, well, is that right? Well, you're just the girl to tell him what a deal he's got coming, huh? <laughs> Why don't you stick around, baby? No, no, not Jacob. Uh, Mr. Jacob, the doctor here and me, we got a little uh, proposition we was wanting to talk over with you. It's a very high-class ethical kind of operation. That's very ethical. Jacob, don't listen. Uh, Ah, baby, are you forgetting where the tin spots are coming from? Uh, Mr. Jacob, uh, what we got in mind is a sort of a clinic, see? Uh, With a doctor's medical education and my business management, this here clinic could help everybody. Uh, Just a few bums. Well... I don't know. Uh... Ain't that right, Sharon? Uh, <laughs> why don't you tell Jacob? Hmm? Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's right. <laughs> there, you see? Well, now you sit down, Mr. Jacob, so we can talk. Psychomagnetic Medical Center. Mr. Erickson? I'm sorry, he can be seen by appointment only. Yes. Thank you for calling. 
Why is Mr. Erickson? Oh, isn't he in his office, Doctor? No, he ain't. Uh, isn't it? There's half a dozen patients waiting to see him. Oh, shall I try to locate him, Dr. Waldo? Uh, call the art theater on Main Street. Ask for Mr. Law. She might be. Jacob, for heaven's sake, where you been? Don't you know there's people waiting to see you? Good afternoon, Doctor. Yeah. Miss Reed. Good afternoon, Mr. Erickson. And now listen, we're putting our blood, sweat, and tears into this operation, Lou and me. You treat it like you couldn't be bothered. Come on into the office. Now sit down and listen. I want to talk to you, Doctor. Yeah, well, I said listen. Lou and me sunk a bundle into this place. We hocked the art theater up to our ears. Now it's beginning to pay off and big. You're in on the take. Am I, Doc? You got 10% of the joint, haven't you? And you didn't put up a stinking dime. Doc, today I sat in the park and a man came up to me. A man who'd seen me at the mission. He was sick, Doc. And I asked him to come to me and I'd help him. And do you know what he said to me, Doc? What did he say? He said, I came to you, Jacob, but they wouldn't let me in. I didn't have enough money. Yeah. Is that right? Doc, didn't we have an agreement anybody could come to the clinic, anybody? Now, don't get on your high horse. Didn't we agree to charge only people who had the money to pay? Oh, sure, Jacob. It must have been a slip off. And this man, this man who'd seen me at the mission said others have been coming here, too. Others who couldn't pay and that they were turned away. Now, is that right, Doc? You answer me, Doc. Well, after all, Lou and Answer he... me. Well, sometimes it depends. It doesn't depend. I've lived with this until my heart can't stand it any longer. I've seen goodness turn to sin. I've hey, seen... Doc, a... break out the bottle. This is a celebration. It's it's night, Lord. This it's is nice. one grand celebration. Hi, Jacob. Hello, Jacob. We're here to celebrate, kids. This is... Uh... Yeah, well, Jacob's not feeling very well, Lou. Some other time. Some maybe. other time. You're out of your mind. Today, right now. Uh, uh, you want to tell him, baby, or you want me to? Lou, you and the doc go on out. What? I want to talk to Jacob alone for a minute. What? You heard me. Well, now, listen, kid, this ain't no secret. Get out. Both of you. Okay, okay, but watch it, baby. I bruise easy. <laughs> Come on, Doc. Jacob. Yes, Sharon? I've always believed in you, Jacob. I want you to know that. What is it, Sharon? Is something wrong? Did they hurt you Listen in some way? Listen to me, way? Jacob. This is a tough thing for me. I... I didn't make it the way I thought I would. Once I said I wanted to stand on an opera stage in Paris. But I couldn't because everybody would look at my crippled leg. And you said you wouldn't. You'd look at my face and hear my voice. Isn't that right, Jacob? I guess so. Where am I now? They are looking at my legs, Jacob, both of them. And they want more. A lot more. I... I just can't take that anymore. I just can't. If... If I had money, Sharon, you could have it. You could always have it. Your money? You give it back to the patients, don't you, Jacob? They shouldn't I've have known that to for a pay. long time, Jacob. I'm going to marry Lou. What? I'm going to marry Lou. Lou? Lou's a coney? I've got to, don't you see? There's nowhere else I can go. There's nothing else I can do. Sharon. Sharon, if, if you'd have me... I'd spend I... the rest of my life without a dime... Living in flop houses, watching you get taken by every sucker. Now, that... don't say that. Well, isn't it the truth? Isn't that what you are, Jacob? A sucker for every con man who ever came along? I was the first one. I got you here, then Doc and then Lou. You always took care of the other guy, Jacob, but what did you ever do for yourself? But I thought you understood. I do. That's why I've got to marry Lou. He's made a lot of money out of this place. And I need money, Jacob. I'm through with flop houses and cheap clothes. <laughs> Jacob, wait! Hey, what's up, Jacob? You sore or something? Jacob, the <laughs> Hey, now listen, that's going too far. 
All of it! All of it! Destroy it! Destroy it! It's sinful, don't you see? What I've been doing is sinful. I was wrong. I did do these things. I'm to blame. It's not your fault, any of you. I did it. These hands are mine. Doc, get the police. No, no. <laughs> Let him alone. He built it. He can tear it down if he wants to. <laughs> These hands. These hands. Please let me alone. Let me alone. Jacob returned to a ranch in the Mojave Desert to work that he knew. And he cared for the animals, and sometimes he healed them. But never again would he minister to a human being. For now, he understood how dangerous it is to heal the body if you cannot also heal the spirit. He knew the meaning of Christ's question, whether it is easier to say to the sick, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk. Tonight, the CBS Radio Workshop has presented Jacob's Hands, an original news story by Aldous Huxley and Christopher Isherwood, with Mr. Isherwood as our narrator. Jacob's Hands was adapted for radio and directed by William Frug. Vic Perrin was featured as Jacob, with Virginia Gregg as Sharon. Others in our cast were Herb Butterfield, Helen Klieb, Larry Dobkin, Harry Bartell, Parley Bear, John Daner, Hans Conried, Bill Conrad, and Janet Stewart. The CBS Radio Workshop is produced in Hollywood by William Frug. This is Hugh Douglas inviting you to join us again next week when from New York we present Living Portrait, an unusual study of one of the nation's most imaginative businessmen, Mr. William Zeckendorf. Whatever your own views on religion may be, CBS Radio believes that you'll be pleased to know that much time, thought, and effort is being devoted to giving children a strong spiritual foundation in Sunday schools throughout America. If your children are not attending Sunday school now, this week, Sunday School Week, is a good time to enroll them. Stay tuned for five minutes of CBS News to be followed on most of these stations by My Son Jeep. America listens most to the CBS Radio Network. Ladies and gentlemen, the distinguished author, Mr. Aldous Huxley. Brave New World is a fantastic parable about the dehumanization of human beings. In the negative utopia described in my story, man has been subordinated to his own inventions. Science, technology, social organization, these things have ceased to serve man. They have become his masters. A quarter of a century has passed since the book was published. In that time, our world has taken so many steps in the wrong direction that if I were writing today, I would date my story not 600 years in the future, but at the most 200. The price of liberty and even of common humanity is eternal vigilance. <laughs> Thank you.
CBS Radio, a division of the Columbia Broadcasting System and its 217 affiliated stations, present the premier broadcast of the CBS Radio Workshop, radio's distinguished series dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. Tonight, part one of two half-hour programs devoted to one of the world's most shocking and famous novels, Aldous Huxley's terrifying forecast of the future, Brave New World. We are proud to have Mr. Huxley as narrator for these broadcasts. Original music is composed and conducted by Bernard Herrmann. This is Aldous Huxley, and these are the sounds of the brave new world, of test tube and decanter, of hissing injectors and gurgling blood substitute. The year is AF 632, 632 years after Ford. We are inside the London Hatchery and Conditioning Centre, and this is the fertilising room, an enormous laboratory where the temperature is never allowed to fall below 98.6. And here comes the director of hatcheries and conditioning in person, bringing with him a group Tomorrow, of young you students. Tomorrow you'll be settling down to serious work. Today I just want to give you a general idea of things. Uh, these are the incubators, and here is the weak supply of ova, kept at blood heat. Uh, come along, boys. Now here, we immerse the eggs into a warm bouillon containing free-swimming spermatozoa. Immersion continues until the eggs are all fertilised. Ah, and over here, here is where we bottle the alphas and betas. In short, gentlemen, the perfect process for manufacturing healthy babies. Are there any questions? Uh, uh, sir, uh, will you explain the uh, Bakanovsky process? I'm glad you asked that. Uh, students, take this down. <laughs> Bakanovsky's process. Where in olden times, one egg made one embryo which made one baby. Today, we've improved on all that. Now the egg will bud, will divide, from eight to 96 buds, and every bud will grow into a perfectly formed embryo, and every embryo into a mature baby, making 96 human beings grow where only one grew before. Progress. But uh, what advantage is it, sir? Uh, I mean... Uh... Oh, my good boy, can't you see? Where in olden times nature allowed us only to have twins or perhaps triplets or so, today we can create scores, yes, scores of identical individuals. We can manufacture men and women in uniform batches. Think of it. An entire factory staffed with the product of one single egg. 96 identical individuals working 96 identical machines. At last, society really knows where it stands. Remember, it was our Ford who gave us the concept of the assembly line when he was on Earth many centuries ago. And now, boys... We will go up to the bottling room where we shall see how we create each class of society. Alphas, betas, deltas, etc. Come with me. Well, Danina. Oh, director. Oh, charming, charming. Ah. What are you injecting into our embryos today, my dear? Typhoid antitoxins? Yes, sir. Are you uh, busy this afternoon? Oh, not after five, sir. Good. Suppose we get together then on the roof. That would be fine. I've admired you for some time, then, Nina. I'm looking forward to a closer acquaintance. Thank you, sir. And now, boys, we're off to the bottling room. You are a lucky girl. The director of hatcheries and conditioning. Oh, hello, Fanny. Oh, you can trust the director to be the perfect gentleman. I saw him pat you. He wants me. You see? That shows what he stands for. The strictest conventionality. And it's about time you started belonging to someone else, my dear. But I like Henry Foster. We've only been with each other four months. Four months? Well, what would the district world controller say? You know how he disapproves anything intense or long-drawn. And it isn't as though there were anything painful or disagreeable about being with one or two other men besides Henry. After all, everyone belongs to everyone else. You're quite right, Fanny, as usual. Good girl. Uh, Fanny, 
Do you know Bernard Marx? <gasps> Bernard Marx? Well, why not? Bernard's an Alpha Plus. Besides, he asked me to go to New Mexico, to the Savage Reservation with him. But his reputation. They say he doesn't like obstacle golf. Oh, they say, they say. And that he spends most of his time by himself alone. They say somebody made a mistake when he was still in the bottle. Thought he was a gamma and put alcohol into his blood substitute. That's why he's so stunted. Oh, what nonsense. Oh, very well, Lenina. It's your life, my dear. But I think you're heading for trouble. And here we have the bottling room. Little embryos carefully bottled being rocked gently to and fro as they did in olden days when carried by their mothers. <gasps> now, boys, you must learn to distinguish between smut and science. I am going to use that word again. As scientists of tomorrow, you must learn to cope with it. Mother. Oh. <coughs> there, that's better. As a matter of fact, there is an area in our world where humans are still viviparous, still give birth to their children. The Savage Reservation in New Mexico. I uh, visited there once myself many years ago. Dreadful, filthy place. Naturally, civilization has improved on all that. Ah, it is here we control the embryo's growth, each batch carefully regulated to produce the exact class of citizen we desire. And here is our Mr. Henry Foster in charge of bottling. Oh, Henry. Uh, yes, sir. Please explain the process to the students. Oh, delighted, sir. By the way, Henry, before you begin, I made a date with Lenina Crown this afternoon. Oh, really? I'm delighted, sir. I'm sure you'll enjoy belonging to her. Good. Very pneumatic girl. Now, please proceed. This way, gentlemen. <clears throat> Here, we advance the process. One by one, the eggs are transferred from their test tubes into these larger decanters and moved along to the labelers. Carefully labeled as to heredity, date of fertilization, sex, name, serial number. Gentlemen, there are 88 cubic feet of card index in this room. Now, here is where we actually predestine and condition. Nothing is so unstabilizing to society as unhappy people. We avoid all that by preconditioning our embryos. And now we are entering the heat conditioning room. Hot tunnels alternating with cool tunnels. Exposure to cold is accompanied by exposure to x-rays. By the time these babies are decanted, they have a perfect horror of cold. Thus, they are perfectly prepared to emigrate to the tropics, to be miners and acetate silk spinners and steel workers. And that... That is the secret of happiness and virtue, liking what you have got to do. All conditioning aims at that, making people like their unescapable social destiny. Oh, ten to three, boys. Time to visit the nurseries. And so the director continued on his tour. Meanwhile, in his rooms high above the city, Bernard Marx nervously paced the floor. I'm taking Lenina Crown in New Mexico with me, Helmholtz, to the Savage Reservation. Well, it's about time. What do you mean by that? I'll be frank, Bernard. There's been a lot of talk about your behavior at the College of Emotional Engineering. Of course, I've been defending you, and I'm but... supposed to be grateful? Because you're a successful feelies writer? Because you're tall, well-built, have all the girls you want? Oh, Bernard... <laughs> Now, you know how I feel. I want to write. I mean, seriously, not slogans or feelies. I, I want to write something important. Uh -huh. now, lately, I've been cutting out my committees and my girls. The director called me in just the other day. Are you in trouble, too? There's a poem I wrote, too emotional, he said. Mm. He gave me the lecture about being an alpha plus, about remembering to behave even as a little infant. I know. I tried to explain to Lenina, but she doesn't understand, or won't understand. All those other men she belongs to, Henry Foster, Benito Hoover, they treat her like, like a side of beef. It's disgusting. It's socially proper. We share and we share alike, remember? But I want her for myself, alone. Bernard, you're my closest friend. Now, you listen to me. You can't win this way. Follow the rules. Play the game. Be happy. 
The nursery was on the fifth floor. The sign over the door said, Neo-Pavlovian Conditioning Room. It was a large, bare room, very bright and sunny. Half a dozen nurses, trousered and jacketed in the regulation white viscose linen uniform, were engaged in setting out bowls of roses in a long row across the floor. The nurses stiffened to attention as the director of hatcheries and conditioning came in, followed by his students. Set out the books. In silence, the nurses obeyed his command. Between the rose bowls, the books were duly set out. Now bring in the children. They hurried out of the room and returned in a moment, each pushing a kind of tall, dumb waiter, laden on all its four wire-netted shelves, with eight-month-old babies, all exactly alike, a Bokhanovsky group, and all, since their caste was Delta, dressed in khaki diapers. Put them down on the floor. Now turn them so they can see the flowers and books. Turned, the babies at once fell silent, then began to crawl towards those clusters of sleek colours, those shapes so gay and brilliant. From the ranks of the babies came little squeals of excitement, gurgles and twitterings of pleasure. The swiftest crawlers were already at their goal. Small hands reached out uncertainly, touched, grasped, unpetaling the roses, crumpling the illuminated pages of the books. Watch carefully, students. All right, nurses, pull the lever. <laughs> and now we proceed to rub in the lesson with a mild electric shock. Take them away, nurses. Observe. Henceforth, books and flowers will be associated in their minds with loud, unpleasant noises and electric shock. And after 200 repetitions of the same or a similar lesson, will be wedded forever. What man has joined, nature is powerless to put asunder. They'll be safe from books and botany all their lives. But, sir... Since these are lower caste children anyway and will never read, why bother to condition them against flowers? Simple economics. If gammas, deltas, or even epsilons like flowers and nature, soon you'd see them wasting their time visiting the countryside. And of what economic use is that? A love of nature keeps no factories busy. <laughs> it was decided to abolish it, at least among the lower classes. Uh, any further questions? Uh, sir, uh, would you tell us about sleep teaching? I'm glad you asked that. The most ingenious development of all, sleep teaching, is given to all our children as they grow to maturity. A little voice murmurs slogans in their ear all the night long while they sleep. Of course, it's useless for teaching, but as a method for giving post-hypnotic suggestions, it is invaluable. It's what conditions our minds to love our future role in life. Now, boys, uh, tell me some of the lessons we've all learned through sleep teaching. A gram is better than a dam. A good example. We have learned to take a gram of soma whenever we feel out of sorts. Euphoric, narcotic, pleasantly hallucinant. It transports our minds into a beautiful sleep filled with wonderful images. It gives a, a soma holiday, thus preventing unnecessary impulses such as anger, jealousy, envy, anxiety. Um, next. Uh, Ending is better than mending. Good. Right. It's better to throw away something than to repair it. New clothing, new possessions keep our factories humming and make us happier. Next. I'm glad I'm not a gamma. Uh -huh. Ah, yes. We're all taught in our sleep to enjoy our own caste, whatever it may be. Gammas are taught to think I'm glad I'm not an epsilon. Betas learn to be glad they're not deltas or gammas. And glad they're not alphas, because we alphas sometimes have to use our minds... And that's very painful. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Very good indeed. Well, students, I think our tour is over for today. I'm sure most of you have dates with pneumatic young ladies. Some, of course, will be wanting to get in a game of obstacle golf. But uh, before we finish, I'd like to add a few footnotes to the things you've seen today. 
Today, we have a controlled society, a happy society. We have stability. Ah, uh, there was a time when these things did not exist. Uh, didn't people grow old and feeble in those days, sir? Indeed they did. Old men in the bad old days used to renounce, retire, uh, take to religion, spend their time reading, thinking, thinking. Oh. Now such is progress. At 60, we have the taste and the powers of a 17-year-old. Why, the old men have no time, no leisure from pleasure. Not a moment to sit down and think. They're much too busy scampering from feely to feely, from girl to pneumatic girl. Yes. Fortunate boys, no pains have been spared to make your lives emotionally easy, to preserve you as far as possible from having emotions at all. Ford's in his flivver, all's well with the world. Ford's in his flivver, all's well with the world. And solemnly and devoutly they made the sign of the tea and hurried off to join their fellow citizens at play. In spite of Fanny's dire warnings, Danina Crown made a date that evening with the eccentric Mr. Marx, partly to show Fanny her courage and partly because she was curious. When they were safely in their helicopter and climbing above the city, she turned to him. Shall we play escalator squash or go to the feelies? Escalator squash is a waste of time. But what else is time for? All right, then, let's go to the feelies. You know, they're showing love on a bearskin rug, and everyone says it's terribly exciting. You can Lenina, actually Lenina, please, feel... couldn't we just go for a walk and be alone together? But, Bernard, we'll be alone all night. Well, I... I, I meant alone for talking. Talking? What about? Oh, you're beginning to feel nasty, I can tell. Take a soma, Bernard. I'd rather be myself, myself and nasty, not somebody else, however jolly. A gram in nine saves nine. Oh, for Ford's sake, be quiet. Bernard. Lenita, don't you ever want to be just you? Not enslaved by your own conditioning to be free? But I am free. I'm free to have the most wonderful time. Everybody's happy nowadays. But wouldn't you like to be free to be happy in your own way and not somebody else's? I simply don't understand you. Bernard, do you really like me? Everyone says I'm awfully pneumatic. <laughs> Eventually, Bernard took Lenina to the Westminster Abbey Cabaret, where Calvin Stopes and his 16 saxophonists were playing. Also featured was London's finest scent and colour organ and all the latest synthetic music. With the aid of four Soma tablets, Bernard managed to spend a successful evening with the girl, and the next morning he agreed to apply at once for a permit to visit the Savage Reservation. He was quite nervous as he stood before the large desk of the director of hatcheries and conditioning. Ah, oh, going to take Lenina Crown, I see. Yes, sir. Very pneumatic. Uh, uh, yes, sir. New Mexico Reservation. How long ago was it? Let me see. 20, 25 years? Hmm. I must have been your age then. Uh, sir? I had the same idea as you. Wanted to have a look at the savages. Got a permit for New Mexico and went there for my summer holiday. With my girl of the moment. She was a beta minus, I think. Oh, yes. She had yellow hair and was especially pneumatic. Well, it was terrible. We rode about on horses and all that, and, and the last day of our stay, she got lost. Somewhere in those horrid mountains. Lost. We never did find her, poor girl. Must have fallen in some crevice. Yes, we searched for days, but no luck. Ugh. Miserable trip. Oh, you must have had a terrible shock. Oh, don't imagine there was anything unethical about it, nothing emotional or long-drawn. It was all perfectly healthy and normal. I'm sure it was, sir. What's that? Oh. Mr. Marks, I should like to take this opportunity of saying I'm not at all pleased with the reports I receive of your behavior outside working hours. Alphas are so conditioned that they do not have to be infantile in their emotional behavior, but that is all the more reason for their making a special effort to conform. And so, Mr. Marx, I give you fair warning. Uh, yes, sir. If ever I again hear of any lapse from a proper standard of infantile decorum, 
I shall ask for your transference to a subcenter, preferably to Iceland. Good morning. The journey was quite uneventful. The Blue Pacific rocket lost four minutes in a tornado over Texas, but was able to land at Santa Fe less than 40 seconds behind schedule. Lenina and Bernard slept that night at Santa Fe, and Lenina was very happy. Imagine 60 escalator squash racket courts in the hotel and obstacle and electromagnetic golf, too. Oh, Bernard, it's simply too lovely. Uh, there will be no scent organs, television, or even hot water once we get out on the reservation. I can stand it. You'll see. Only progress is lovely, isn't it? <laughs> They took a rocket ship into the interior, and from there they traveled on horseback. And all Bernard could think about was Iceland, and how cold and barren it would be. The director's warning had made him even quieter and more sullen than usual. And then, that evening, they reached their destination. Before them was the village of Malpais, situated on a mesa. Adobe hovels growing out of the stony ground, dust and squalor, and the smell of wood smoke. What an awful place. I don't like it. Who's that man coming toward us? He used to be our guide. I I'm frightened, Bernard. Quiet. We shouldn't have come. Oh, good morrow. You're civilized, aren't you? You come from outside, from the other place? My name is Bernard Marx. This is Lenina Crown. Hmm. My name is John. Come with me. He speaks English. That's strange. Probably trained as a guide. Where is he leading us? To that hut, I believe. Uh, there seems to be some sort of activity over there. Orgy! Orgy! Why, it's like our lower caste community sing. Only look, now they're beating themselves with whips. Oh, no, Bernard! It's got something to do with their religion. What a wonderful intensity of feeling it must generate. I often think one may have missed something in not having passions like that. Nonsense. Bernard, what's wrong with that man? Where? Oh, he's just old, that's all. Old? But, but we don't look like that when we're old. He's so wrinkled, so... Oh, it's horrible. That's because we age all at once. We stay 17 until we're 60 or so, and, and then... And then we die, and they burn our bodies and recover the phosphorus for the good of the world state, just as it should be. But this... <gasps> what is it? That... That woman! Oh, Bernard, no! Take me away! Take me away! She's only nursing her baby, Lenina. That's her child. She's the mother. Bernard, how can you be so vulgar? Oh, I think I'll be sick. Please, Bernard, anywhere. Anywhere. Is something wrong? I think we'd better take Lenina inside. Uh, Over here. Follow me. My Soma. I'm out of Soma. Bernard. I'm sorry, Lenina. I didn't bring him. Oh. Here. Inside. This is my home. This is my home. You are welcome to remain here. John? John? Yes, Mother. Mother? These are people from the outside, Mother. They have come to see the reservation. From the other place? You're from the other place. Don't come near me. But don't you see, I'm from there, too. I'm civilized. I don't belong here. It's, it's all a terrible mistake. This is my mother, Linda. Uh, were you born here? No. No, I tell you, I was decanted like normal people. Oh, thank Ford, someone has come. At last, thank Ford. Bernard, Bernard, please keep her away. Could you tell us about yourself, please? Well, I came here 25 years ago with a man. His name was Thomas. We went riding together on, on horses. There was a terrible storm. I got lost, lost in this horrible place. It was the last day of our stay. He left me here, alone. Lenina? Yes? Uh, you will be interested to know that our director of hatcheries and conditioning is named Thomas, oh. and that he came here 25 no. years ago. Oh, no, no. And that... It can't be. But it is. Well, he told me so himself. <laughs> what a discovery. This boy... This boy is our director's son. 
Our director is a father. Oh, it's too horrible. <laughs> Mother, what is he saying? <laughs> Iceland. Iceland, indeed. Bernard, stop it. Well, we'll see who tells who where to go now. Uh, John. Yes, sir? How would you and your mother like to return to civilization? Do you mean it? Oh, please, do you? Listen, they're crazy here. I was a beta minus. I always worked in the fertilizing room. I was a good worker. But how can I tell them? They don't understand. They mend things. They don't know what a helicopter is or, or, or Soma. They have babies, like dogs. Oh, it's too revolting. Oh, thank God. If it hadn't been for my son, for John, what a comfort he has been to me. Your son? How can you? You were beta minus. I know, I know, but he's been a comfort to me just the same. If only I'd had Soma. Oh, do you mean it? Will you take us back to civilization? <laughs> of course. Uh, we'll leave tomorrow. <laughs> you and your son. Back to civilization. <laughs> And Bernard was as good as his word. That very night, he and John and his mother and Lenina took the Blue Pacific rocket to London. For Lenina, it was a happy trip since she had taken four somers the minute they got back to the hotel. For John, it was a voyage of discovery. Poor Linda, his mother, could only weep for joy. But for Bernard, it was a moment of triumph. Triumph such as he had never known before. Brave New World, Part One, by Aldous Huxley. A startling, shocking account of what can happen to our civilization 600 years in the future. And more importantly, a warning to all of us against the destruction of moral standards, family life, and the soul of man. Join us next week when we will continue with part two of Aldous Huxley's terrifying forecast of the future of what could become the brave new world. Presented on the CBS Radio Workshop. <laughs> The CBS Radio Workshop is produced and directed by William Frug. Brave New World was adapted for radio by Mr. Frug. Featured in the cast were Joseph Kearns, Bill Idelson, Gloria Henry, Charlotte Lawrence, Byron Kane, Sam Edwards, Jack Crucian, Vic Perrin, and Lorreen Tuttle. Original music composed and conducted by Bernard Herman. This is the CBS Radio Network. Ladies and gentlemen, the distinguished author, Mr. Aldous Huxley. Brave New World is a study of the future as it may be unless we are extremely careful. It depicts a society in which man has replaced nature by science, morality by drugs, individuality by total conformity. It is a hideous prospect, yet we seem determined to follow this path of self-destruction. But Brave New World need not be our future. The choice, after all, is always in our own hands. CBS Radio, a division of the Columbia Broadcasting System and its 217 affiliated stations present the CBS Radio Workshop, radio's distinguished series dedicated to man's imagination. The Theater of the Mind.
Tonight, part two of two half-hour programs devoted to one of the world's most shocking and famous novels. Aldous Huxley's terrifying forecast of the future, Brave New World. And we are proud to once again have Mr. Huxley as our narrator. Original music is composed and conducted by Bernard Herrmann. This is Aldous Huxley. In the garden outside the London Hatchery and Conditioning Centre, it was playtime. Naked in the warm June sunshine, six or seven hundred little boys and girls were running with shrill yells over the lawns, or playing games, or squatting silently in twos and threes among the flowering shrubs. And strolling across the smooth turf came the director of hatcheries and conditioning, followed eagerly by a group of new students. And here we have playtime for our little tots. Notice the games, all carefully constructed to use as many mechanical devices as possible. In olden times, children used to play simple games using only a ball and a bat. <laughs> Madness. Nothing was added to increase consumption. Then came our Ford. He taught us the principle of mass production in the assembly line many centuries ago and changed all that. Good morning, Director. Sir, what an unexpected pleasure. Boys, this is the resident controller for Western Europe. This is his Ford ship, Master for Mond. Boys. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. I was just showing the students the children, sir. Lovely children. Busy as bees at their unrestricted play. Controller, if you have the time, I wonder if you might tell the students something about the bad old days. I might. Where are you taking them? To the hatchery and conditioning center to see the manufacturing of the babies. Very well, I'll walk along with you. Ah. Yes, in the old days, children lived in a place called home. A rabbit hole with suffocating intimacies. Maniacally, the mother... Uh, please don't be shocked at that word. The mother brooded over her children. Her children. Our Ford, or our Freud, as for some inscrutable reason he chose to call himself whenever he spoke of psychological matters, our Freud was the first to reveal the appalling dangers of family life. Unpleasant as they may seem, students... These are facts. People used to be viviparous, gave birth to their children. What were the consequences? A world dominated by mothers and fathers was a world full of every kind of perversion, from sadism to chastity. There were also husbands, wives, and lovers. Now everyone belongs to everyone else. Thank Ford for progress. Yes, thank, thank Ford. Ford. Actually, we still preserve a few outmoded ethics of pre-stable societies in our savage reservations. Did you ever visit a reservation, Director? Yes, I once went to look at the savages in New Mexico. Well, that must have been 25 years ago. Mother's, father's marriage. Oh, very repulsive. Uh, yes. Uh, well, here we are. I'll say goodbye. Goodbye, controller, and thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thank you. And now, boys, if you'll follow me inside the hatchery. And here we are, a hive of activity. Alpha's superintending, Beta's doing the skilled work, Gamma's in green, busy at routine jobs, and Delta's in khaki, incapable of doing anything except sweeping the floor. Every member of society perfectly content to belong to his predestined caste. Except for a few criminal exceptions, which reminds me, one of those criminal exceptions is meeting us here at 11. An alpha plus, no less, Mr. Bernard Marx. What has he done, sir? What has he done? He refuses to participate in mechanical sports. He is lax. He... Ah, here he comes now. Good morning, director. Mr. Marx. You and Lena Crown returned from the Savage Reservation last night, I understand. Yes, sir. Uh, we visited some of the places you told me about last week, Director. In fact, uh, we science. met... Science! Your attention, please. Everyone step this way. If I have interrupted your labors, it is because a painful duty constrains me. This man who stands before you, this Alpha Plus, the highest level of society, has grossly betrayed the trust imposed in him by his heretical views on sports and Soma, by his scandalous refusal to be promiscuous 
He has proved himself an enemy of society, a subverter, ladies and gentlemen, of all order and stability, a conspirator against civilization itself. For this reason, I am ordering his immediate transference to a sub-center of the lowest order. In Iceland, he will have small opportunity to lead others astray by his unfordly example. Bernard Marx, can you show any reason why I should not now execute the judgment passed upon you? Yes, I can. What did you say? You told me you visited the Savage Reservation 25 years ago, Director, with a young Beta Minus, I believe. Uh, you told me she was lost during a storm and that you returned without her. I thought perhaps you'd like to see her again. Linda? Thomas! Thomas! Oh, Thomas, it's me! Don't you remember? You're Linda! Oh, I knew I'd recognize you, Thomas. You look just the same. No one ages here. Thomas, look at me. I'm Linda. Remember? Hug me. Hold me. What is the meaning of this? Who is this hag? Thomas. Oh, Thomas, it's Linda. Linda, you're beta minus. John, look, it's him. It's your father. 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 Oh. What's the meaning of this disgusting joke? Who is this savage and this dreadful woman? Take them away! It isn't a joke. It's absolutely true. I'm his mother and you're the father. Father, it's me, John. I'm your son. <laughs> and now, now who is guilty of antisocial behavior, director? No, 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 no! A father as director of hatcheries. It was out of the question. The controller asked for his resignation. And all upper caste London was wild to see the savage and his mother. Bernard Marx became a hero. And even Lenina Crown had her share of reflected glory. Good morning, Lenina. Oh, good morning, Fanny. Well, you certainly seem pleased with yourself. Yes, I am pleased. Bernard called up half an hour ago. He has to go to a party at the controllers, and he asked me if I'd take the savage to the feelies this evening. Oh, lucky girl. What's he like, Lenina? I've heard he's terribly good-looking. Oh, he is, but so very odd. In what way? Well, the day Bernard and I left the reservation, the savage came into my room. I'd taken a soma, so I didn't notice him until suddenly I awakened, and there he was bending over me. What happened? Well, naturally, I assumed something was going to happen, but instead of that, he just ran out of the room. Well, how odd. What a terribly ungentlemanly thing to do. Doesn't he like you? Oh, I'm sure he does, so I can't make it out. And oh, please don't tell this to anyone, Fanny. It upsets me, because I like him. I mean, I really like him. <gasps> Lenina! I know it's immoral, but I just can't help myself. I do like him. The days passed. Success went fizzily to Bernard's head. His diffidence turned to bumptiousness. His nonconformity was forgotten and he became completely orthodox. The resident world controller appointed him official escort for the savage and asked him to make regular reports on the young man's reactions to civilization. This Bernard did assiduously. <laughs> Today I sent the savage to the Feelys with Lenina Crown. The feature was three weeks in a helicopter. Instead of holding the knobs on the chair arms, thus enabling him to experience the sensations of the lovers on the screen, the savage refused to participate. Lenina tells me he called the film vulgar and indecent. The savage refuses to take Soma and seems most distressed because the woman, Linda, his uh, M-O-T-H-E-R, uh, remains permanently on summer holiday. Uh, in spite of her senility and the extreme repulsiveness of her appearance, uh, the savage frequently goes to see her and appears much attached to her. <laughs> Oh, 
What do you mean you refuse to come down to dinner? Bernard, I'm sick. I've eaten civilization and I'm sick. Do you realize that I've invited the most important people in London tonight? The Ford Chief Justice is here. The Arch Community Songster of Canterbury has flown in just to meet you. You've changed, Bernard. You used to feel the way I do about things. I talked to Helmholtz Watts and he says you've changed too. I haven't. Listen, if you don't come downstairs for my dinner party, I'll be the laughing stock of London. I'll come. Just let me read this to you first. Hmm? One day, many years ago, I found this book in my mother's room. One of the Indians had found it in a cave. It must be hundreds of years old. Hmm. It's called The Complete Works of William Shakespeare. Oh, I've heard of him. We don't allow it. Smut. But... He says all the things I feel about Lenina. Listen to this. Mm -hmm. Is there no pity sitting in the clouds that sees into the bottom of my grief? Oh, sweet my mother, cast me not away. Delay this marriage for a month, a week. <laughs> marriage? Oh, Ford, no. Bernard. <laughs> oh, marriage, that's too good, really. Bernard, stop it. <laughs> and, and mother. Oh, sweet my mother. Oh, he's positively vulgar. You stop oh, wait it. Wait till I tell Helmholtz about this. Stop it or I'll hit you. <laughs> oh, come. Now, where's your sense of humor? Bernard. Can't you see how funny it is? Get out. I said leave me alone. No, I, I, I'm leaving, John. I'm leaving. How beauteous mankind is. Oh, brave new world that has such people in it. The next morning, a pneumatic young girl, crisply clad in a beta minus viscose linen suit, stood outside the door of the savage's apartment and somewhat nervously rang the buzzer. Lenina. You don't seem very glad to see me, John. Not glad. Oh, if you only knew. May I come in, then? May I kiss your hand, Lenina? My hand? Admired, Lenina. Indeed, the top of admiration, worth what's dearest in the world. I wanted to do something first to show I was worthy of you. What? are you talking about? Lanina, tell me something. I'll do anything you tell me, anything at all. I'd sweep the floor if you wanted. But we've got vacuum cleaners here. It isn't necessary. No, of course it isn't necessary. But some kinds of baseness are nobly undergone. I, I'd like to undergo something noble just to show you how much I love you, Lanina. <gasps> do you mean it, John? Yes, but I hadn't meant to say it. Not until I... Listen, Lenina, on the reservation, people get married. Get what? For always. They make a promise to live together for always. What a disgusting idea. Answer me this question, John. Do you really like me or don't you? I love you more than anything in the world. Well, then, why on earth didn't you say so? Come here to me, John. Hug me. Oh, but Lenina... Hug me till you drug me, honey. Kiss me till I'm in a coma. Lenina, what are you doing? No, no, get away from me. Don't come near me. Hug me, honey. You, you strumpet. A dram is better than a dad. Get out. But don't you want get me? Get out of my sight. Oh, John. Before I kill you. Oh, he's mad. He's gone mad. Oh, thou weed, who art so lovely fair and smellst so sweet that the sense aches at thee. Impudent strumpet, impudent strumpet, impudent strumpet. <coughs> Hello. Yes, this is Mr. Savage. Who's ill? Linda. My mother dying. Yes, yes, I'll come at once.
Welcome to the Park Lane Hospital for the Dying. You've come to see someone in the galloping senility ward? Yes. My mother. Oh, how vulgar. You know who I mean. Linda. Oh, oh, yes. Room 43, bed 16. She'll be dying any minute now. This way, please. Is there any hope? Well, of course not. Or else she wouldn't have been sent here. Through these doors. <laughs> What are these children doing here? Death conditioning, of course. It starts at 18 months. Every tot spends two mornings a week in a hospital for the dying. All the best toys are kept here, and they get chocolate ice cream on death days. They learn to take dying as a matter of course. This way. Oh, here we are. Well, I must go. I've got my batch of children coming. Time for their chocolate ice cream. Linda? Linda, it's John. Your eyes are open, but you don't know me, do you? It's John, your son. Linda? Linda, don't you know me? Hug me till you drug me, honey. Kiss me till I'm in a coma. <gasps> Linda. Linda. <sighs> Mother. <laughs> The menial staff of the Park Lane Hospital for the Dying consisted of 162 deltas, 84 red-headed female twins, and 78 identical mongoloid male twins. At six, when their working day was over, the two groups assembled in the vestibule of the hospital and were served their daily soma ration. It was into this crowd that the savage walked, so overcome with his grief and his remorse that he did not realize he was shouldering his way into the gathering throng. All right, here it is, Soma distribution. In good order, please. Oh, hurry up there, stand in line for your Soma. Linda. Linda died because of this. Oh, now don't grab, there's enough for everybody. One gram for an evening's delight, two for a trip to the gorgeous east, and four for a weekend in paradise. How beauteous mankind is. Oh, brave new world that has such people in it. Stop! Stop! Ford is a savage. Listen, I beg you, lend me your ears. Don't take that horrible stuff. It's poison. Mr. Savage, please, the people are waiting. You're slaves, all of you. Don't you want to be men? Don't you want freedom? Freedom? Ford Almighty, call the police. <laughs> From somewhere behind the milling, angry crowd, Bernard Marx saw the savage. He and his friend, Helmholtz Watson, had been searching for John. Now they hurried forward. Helmholtz, he's mad. They'll lynch him. Oh, Ford, help us. Ford, help those who help themselves, Bernard. Come on. Where are you going? Come back. It's a fight, a real fight. I've been waiting all my life for this. Man at last. I'll make you free whether you want to be or not. Give me those soma boxes. Sir, Mr. Savage, no! Stop it! Helmholtz! Join me! Yes! Stop throw it. the poison pills away! By all means, throw them away! Stop it! Freedom! Be men and be free! Over here, officers, this Freedom. way! Give them the Throw them away! Freedom! Stand up as men! Win your soma. freedom! Soma spray! When John, you're done. Read Take them to the word. resident controller's office. All right. All right, it's all over. We're all happy now. We're so happy. We all love each other, don't we? Oh, yes, we all love each other. Line up for your Soma.
So you don't much like civilization, Mr. Savage? No, I don't. John, you're talking to the resident controller. We don't need your comments, Mr. Marks. I think civilization is horrible. And yet people are happy. They get what they want, and they never want what they can't get. They're well off. They're safe. They're never ill. They're not afraid of death. They're blissfully ignorant of passion and old age. They're plagued with no mother or father. They've got no wives or children to feel strongly about. They're so conditioned that they practically can't help behaving as they ought to behave. <laughs> and you ask them to chuck this all away for liberty? My good boy. All the same, it seems quite horrible to me. Of course it does. Actual happiness always looks pretty squalid in comparison with the overcompensations for misery. And being contented has none of the glamour of a good fight against misfortune. Happiness is never grand. They call this happiness working at an embryo assembly line manufacturing babies? Science, my boy. Besides, they like it. Well, Mr. Marks, the time has come. You are being sent to an island. To, to an island? Oh, please, sir, don't send me to Iceland. I, I promise I'll do what I should. I'll conform to the rules. One would think he was going to have his throat cut, whereas if he had the smallest sense, he'd understand his punishment is really a reward. He'll be sent to an island where he'll meet the most interesting set of men and women in the world, all the people who weren't satisfied with orthodoxy. Everyone in a word, who's anyone? Then why didn't you go to an island yourself? Because, finally, I preferred this. Sometimes I regret it. Happiness is a hard master, particularly other people's happiness. Well, gentlemen, there are many islands available. Which climate do you choose, Mr. Watson? Well, I should like a thoroughly bad climate. I think I'd write better if I had to contend with difficulties. How about the Falkland Islands? That would be fine. Good. You may leave now. You too, Mr. Marks. Oh. Uh, goodbye, Helmholtz. Goodbye, Bernard. Goodbye, John. Goodbye, John. One more question. Of course. Where is God in this scheme of yours? It's a subject that has always had a great interest for me. You've never read this, of course, the Holy Bible, New and Old Testaments. I've got quite a few revolting old books like that here. But if you know about God, why don't you tell the people? Well, this book is old. It's about God hundreds of years ago, not God now. But God doesn't change. Men do, though. No, my friend. Call it the fault of civilization. God isn't compatible with machinery and scientific medicine and universal happiness. But when you're alone, it's natural to believe in God. When you're quite alone in the night, thinking about death... But people are never alone now. We make them hate solitude, and we arrange their lives so that it's almost impossible for them ever to have it. No solitude, no God. Is that why there's no self-denial here, no God, no reason for it? Of course. Industry and prosperity are only possible when there is no self-denial. If there were, the wheels would stop turning. But God's the reason for everything noble and fine and heroic. My dear young friend, civilization has absolutely no need for nobility or heroism. Your condition so that you can't help doing what you ought to do. And what you ought to do is, on the whole, so pleasant. So many of the natural impulses are allowed free play that there really aren't any temptations to resist. Anybody can be virtuous now. No temptations, no inconveniences. But I like the inconveniences. We don't. We prefer to do things comfortably. But I don't want comfort. I want God. I want poetry. I want real danger. I want freedom. I want goodness. I want sin. In fact, you're claiming the right to be unhappy. All right. I'm claiming the right to be unhappy. Not to mention the right to grow old and ugly and impotent. The right to have cancer, the right to have too little to eat, the right to live in 
constant apprehension of what may happen tomorrow, the right to be tortured by unspeakable pains of every kind. I claim them all. You're welcome. Bernard and Helmholtz left for their islands, but the savage was not allowed to go with them. The controller wished to continue the experiment. Three weeks later, the savage ran away. After some days of wandering, he took refuge in an abandoned lighthouse. But his desire for solitude was not to be fulfilled. His hiding place was discovered. There were articles in the papers. Sightseers came by the thousands. One Sunday, Lenina Crown came for a picnic with three of her latest boyfriends. The day after her visit, two young reporters came to call hoping for an exclusive interview. The door of the lighthouse was ajar. They pushed it open and walked into a shuttered twilight. Through an archway on the further side of the room, they could see the bottom of the staircase that led up to the higher floors. Just under the crown of the arch dangled a pair of feet. They called. No one answered. They saw him. At last the savage had found solitude. He was alone, quite alone. Thus concludes Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. We wish to thank Mr. Huxley for appearing on these broadcasts as our narrator. And uh, we would also like to thank you, our listeners, for your enthusiastic response to this new series. This is William Conrad inviting you to join us again next week when we present George Stewart's dramatic account of one of nature's most terrifying phenomena, Storm. The following week, listen as Dr. Frank C. Baxter interviews William Shakespeare. Presented on the CBS Radio Workshop. The CBS Radio Workshop is produced and directed by William Frug. Brave New World was adapted for radio by Mr. Frug. Featured in the cast were Joseph Kearns, Herb Butterfield... Bill Idelson, Gloria Henry, Charlotte Lawrence, Parley Bear, Dora Singleton, Jack Crucian, Vic Perrin, and Lorene Tuttle. Original music composed and conducted by Bernard Herman. America listens most to the CBS Radio Network. <laughs>